everybody. Um, so we're going to look at another concept today, the concept of arc length. <clears throat> and we're going to use some of the methods, uh, some of the kind of processes, the, the way of thinking that we use to uh, come up with an idea for area, these integrals. So let's let's jump right in and define some of our terms. We're going to be, um, we're going to start with a function. I'll just call it f of f, f of x. Um, and we're going to assume its derivative is continuous on some interval a to b. Okay, so we need something a little stronger uh, than we needed for for integrals themselves. Uh, this is a stronger condition that its its inter, uh, derivative is continuous. Sometimes this, this condition having a continuous derivative, uh, people will refer to as calling f uh, a smooth function, right? Because what does it mean if um, the derivative is not continuous, right? When do we get discontinuous derivatives? Corners can work when you've got little pinches or if the function jumps. If the, if the derivative is continuous, Right? It, it changes in a kind of predictable way at each step. So it's smooth. There's no big um, uh, changes, jumps in the change of direction or anything like that. If it wants to turn, it has to turn like a curve, not like a corner. Um, okay, so we start with something that has a continuous derivative or is, is smooth. And our goal in this is we wanna find the length of the graph of f, that curve that makes up the graph, from, well, our two endpoints. So oops, from the point a, f of a, to b, f of b. OK? So let's get a little picture uh, of, of what we're talking about here. So I'll draw out some axes. Let's make them a little thicker. Let's do another one. All right, so there are our axes. Let's draw our function. Nothing too complicated. Okay, and let's define the interval. So the interval, I'm just calling this A and this b. So we want to find the length of this curve from the point a f of a to the point b f of b. Okay? So that little that little portion of the curve in there is what we're interested in. So here's where we're going to use the thinking we use to come up with the idea of areas under curves. We're going to take this complicated problem, right? How do you measure this curve um, and, and chop it up into simple problems? And we're going to do it in a very similar way. I'm going to start by cutting up this interval from A to B into some sub intervals, right? So I've drawn however many I just drew there. Don't think of a specific number of them. Right, we're gonna we're gonna as as you may have guessed, just like we did with area, we'll eventually take the limit of the number of intervals we have to infinity. So I'm just drawing an arbitrary amount here. Let's name. I'll call a the point x naught. We'll get x one, x two, and so on. Somewhere in the middle here, we might have the one of these called x sub i minus one, then x sub i, and on and on and on, right? So they're just indexing by some numbers. And then at the end, we get to x sub n, right? So we'll just chop this up into a subinterval. Okay. For each of these endpoints of the subinterval, let's draw a point on the graph. I don't know if I quite got that right, but you can imagine above each of these intervals, we have a point on the graph. And what we can do for each of these sub intervals is connect these points with a straight line. Okay. 
okay? So now I have a whole bunch of straight line pieces, straight line segments. We know how to find lengths of those, okay? And, and so we'll get an approximation. You can look at this picture uh, that we're having, a, we have a pretty decent approximation. So let's, let's pretend, let's zoom in on a piece of this curve, right? So I'm just gonna kind of draw some little piece of the curve. And we're gonna look at some interval. Okay, so this is one of these sub intervals, right? It might be, might be this last one here or something like that. It doesn't matter, any one of these, right? And you can imagine, unless the function happens to be a straight line at that point, that this straight line segment is not quite going to match. We can see that it's not exactly uh, the same here. But it's still a good estimate, okay? So here's what we can do. Whoops. Oops. Let's make it a little nicer. We're going to use triangles. So if I imagine drawing a horizontal line from one point, vertical line from the other point, we get a nice little right triangle. And let's look at the lengths of these sides. This side is just the width of one of our sub intervals. And we already have a name we're used to using for this, delta x. This won't change, right? We're gonna, we're gonna imagine chopping up this interval into evenly spaced endpoints. So delta x, the difference between all of them is the same for each of them. So I just have uh, this label delta x. Oh, let's also put in some, some names for these points. This is, let's call this x sub i minus one, f of x sub i minus one. And then this will be, this point is x sub i, f of x sub i, right? So we're just picking an arbitrary interval. Now here, this length is the distance between these two y coordinates, okay? So I wanna call this delta y. Um, however, we have to be a little careful. The distance between the y coordinates changes, right? You might notice, for instance, if I look on this interval, here's my distance in, in the change of these y coordinates from there to there it's fairly large versus somewhere like here where there's hardly any distance between those two. So depending on where we are on the curve, delta y changes. So I'm gonna index it, right? It's, it's for this particular interval. And the way we would figure it out is by taking the value of the function at the last endpoint and subtracting the value at the first endpoint. Okay, so that gives us our, our uh, this gives us the length of this vertical side of this triangle. So let's let's name the length, right? So remember, let me let me take a step back. What we're doing, we want to come up with a way to express this length. This is our approximating length for this segment. I'm calling it L sub i. L sub i, using the Pythagorean theorem, is just going to be the square root of this leg of the triangle squared plus this leg of the triangle squared, right? So it's just the Pythagorean theorem there. And then we're gonna do a little bit of algebra. We'll take, I'm gonna factor out a delta x squared from everything and take it outside of the square root. So we'll get a delta x here we get one plus, and here we're gonna have delta y sub i over delta x squared, okay? So I'll let you do the details of that algebra, but you can imagine if you take this delta x inside, it comes inside as an x squared. This is a positive length. We don't have to worry about uh, absolute values or anything like that, or taking the square roots of negatives, any, anything of that nature. Um, but these are the same expression, okay? Now, here's a, Here's a nice little reminder of something from uh, some previous courses. Uh, we have something called the mean value theorem. So let me just do a little sketch of this so over here. Let's say I have some function. Um, if I have a function 
what the mean value theorem tells us, if we have a continuous function over some interval, um, one way to interpret it is as if I take, if I take the line connecting the two endpoints, I can find a point somewhere in here, at least one point, and in this case, there's, it looks like there's more than one, where the slope of the tangent line is the same as the slope of the line connecting the two endpoints. Another way of saying that is the derivative, there's a point in this interval, I'll call it, um, I'm already using x sub i, let's just call it x star. whose derivative is equal to the change in the y coordinates. So this might be x1, y1, x2, y2. This is just going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? The slope of that line. In other words, delta y over delta x. So if we have a continuous function and an inner over an interval, then there's some point in there where the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the line connecting the endpoints of that interval, right? That's what this is saying. Well, we can apply that here and know that somewhere in this interval, looking at my picture now, there is a point, right? So I've got this L sub i is the line, the length of the line connecting these two endpoints. In my picture, right, it looks clearly like there's some point where the tangent line is parallel to that line, okay? So if we call that point, I'm gonna call it um, X sub I star, then what I can say Delta y sub i over delta x, which is just the slope of this line, is equal to the derivative of some point in that interval. Okay, so you can see this from the picture, right? It looks like about there, that some point in the interval has uh, the same tangent line slope as the line connecting those endpoints, right? This is one of the reasons we needed this function to be smooth so we can make this claim. It has to be continuous over all the intervals, okay? So there we go with, uh, so now we've got a nice, fairly simple formula. So now if we want the arc length of the whole curve, right? So remember what we're doing, we're looking at one little piece here. Now let's just add them all up. We will say the arc length, I'll call it L, is going to be approximately the sum y equals one to n. And I'm just gonna write this expression that we came up with. Well, I can, I can just write it of all the L sub i's, right? We add up all of these, these uh, approximating lengths. In other words, L is equal to one plus F prime x i star, oops, I need squared. And then I'm just moving that delta x to the end, okay? Well, now looking at that, you might guess where we're going next. If we take the limit of this, we'll take that to be the arc length, the limit as n goes to infinity. In other words, as we get better and better approximations. And then in the limit, right, we might recognize this as a Riemann sum over the integral a to b, oops, not f of x dx, square root of one plus f prime of x squared dx. Okay, so this gives us a nice, fairly straightforward formula for computing the arc length. The integrals aren't always the easiest to take, but we'll talk about what we can do in those cases in just a moment. Let's write this up 
without all the, all the computation, let's just write out what the result is. So if we take If we have, uh, let, let's say, let f of x be a smooth function on the interval a, b, then let's get some space here. The arc length. Uh, of the graph of f of x from a f of a to b f of b is given by and I'll use l again L is equal to the integral from A to B of the square root of one plus the derivative of F squared dx. Okay, and there is our there is our arc length formula. Okay. So let's do an example now of using this. So my first, we're gonna do two examples. First one, I think is pretty straightforward. We'll say, let's find the arc length of y equals one plus six x to the three halves over the interval zero to one. Okay, so first of all, we need to know that this uh, function is smooth. Let's, uh, let's look at its derivative. Y prime is going to be nine X to the one half. And this is certainly defined for all values of X in this interval and it's continuous. Um, uh, so this is, I think, one of our standard functions. We know that this is continuous over this interval, so we're good there. So now we just need to compute the arc length from zero to one, one plus, and I'm taking the derivative squared. I just computed the derivative, so squaring it, we'll get 81x dx. We can solve this integral with a u substitution. u is going to be equal to 81x. du uh, is going to be 81 dx, or I like to do it this way. 1 over 81 du is equal to dx. That constant, I'm just going to throw at the front of the integral. We know it can slip through. My bounds change when x is, oops, sorry, I have the wrong substitution. I wanted to do one plus 81x. That was when in my notes, I just forgot the one plus. Doesn't change the rest of it. When x is equal to zero, u is equal to one. When x is equal to one, u is equal to 82. And putting u in for the square root, in, in for the argument of the square root, 1 plus 81x, we get the square root of u or u to the 1 half du. And this is a pretty straightforward integral. I've got 1 over 81. The antiderivative of u to the 1 half, my power goes up by 1. And I get the reciprocal of that new power out here. And I'm evaluating this from 1 to 82. I can factor the constant two thirds out, combine that with the one over 81, I get two over 243. And I've got 82 to the three halves minus one. Okay. 
And that's perfectly reasonable answer. If we want to, we can punch that into a calculator. I'm gonna leave it as is it's the most precise way I can think to write this number down. Um, so I'll leave it like this. That is, that is the arc length, this number two 240 thirds of the three halves power of 82 minus one. Okay. All right, let's, let's do one more example. Um, this one was, this first one is, is designed to work out relatively nicely, but let's take something a little less nice. Let's start with, let's uh, find the arc length uh, of the graph Uh, of y equals, I wanted to do cosine of x over zero to pi. Okay, so same idea. First of all, can we use the arc length formula? Is cosine uh, uh, a smooth function? Its derivative is negative sine, which is continuous everywhere, so we're good. So let's go ahead and compute. Uh, we'll, we'll need y prime is negative sine of x. So that makes the length, just plugging into the formula, zero to pi of one plus negative sine of x squared dx, which I can write if I want as the square root of one plus sine squared x, which is terrible abusive notation that everybody does. So there it is. Okay, this is not an easy integral to compute. We can't do it with any of the methods we have. It's not, a, it's not even with sophisticated methods, it's not a very easy integral to compute. And we just, this is the nature of this formula. It's not an easy formula. However, that doesn't mean all is lost. Let's use um, some computing Let's use some, some software to help us out here. So let me open up, let's use Desmos. We can, there's lots of software out there that does this. And let me just write down what it is we're trying to do. We've got, um, let's see, the integral we wanted to compute was L equal to uh, zero to pi square root of one plus sine squared x dx. So besides graphing, uh, Desmos can do a lot of things for us and one of them is integrals. So if you notice down here, oops, I gotta turn off my annotating. If I look down here, I get um, there are lots and lots of things I can like an integral sign that I can put in. Or if you type things like, int that gives me the integral so a lot of them are pretty intuitive zero you might guess what pi is pi pi um, and then i can do square root so again you can find the square root down here on this keypad or sqrt gives me a square root one plus sine of x I'm putting the squared outside like this. Remember, that means the same thing as the way I've written sine squared x there, because I, I don't recall if the software knows how to recognize uh, that exponent inside. So this for sure is correct. And then dx. And notice it gives us a numerical approximation. So um, we'll, we'll see in later videos some, some ways to compute integrals numerically, meaning we don't actually find the antiderivatives. There's various approximating algorithms we can use. And the computer uses them and gets an integral good out to however many decimal places we see there. Um, and so that's a simple way to get, get the results sometimes. Let's, um, let's do one other thing while we're here. Let's, let's remember we were starting by looking at the graph of cosine of x. Okay, and we were trying to get the length of the curve from zero to pi. So between these two points, okay? 
Well, let's approximate this with a line, right? There's a line between those two points. Notice this line, I can make a nice triangle. Let's see if I can make this a little bit thicker. Ah, it's too much trouble. Okay, so now let's let's think about this triangle. The triangle that we have here, the length of this side from one to negative one is, is two. The length of this side from zero to pi is pi. Let's get an approximation for L using just one giant interval, right? This is the same idea we did with all these little subintervals, but just with one giant interval, Let's get an approximation. It's pretty clear from the picture, and this is almost always going to be the case. This approximation is smaller than the real value, right? It's, it's the shortest line between these two points instead of this curved line. But it should be something relatively close. It doesn't look horribly far off. Using the Pythagorean theorem, this is going to be two squared, the square root of two squared plus pi squared. And we can use Desmos to give us. Uh, decimal value for this square root of four plus pi squared. And we see the result is 3.72. So we're off, this approximation is off by uh, just a little less than a tenth, it looks like, um, which is not too bad. Right, not too bad of an approximation for just one sub interval. Um, okay, that's it for this one. This is a pretty straightforward formula. I hope the derivation made sense, but even if it doesn't, uh, while you're working on making that make sense, you can still apply this formula, obviously. Um, okay, thank you, everybody. I will see you next time.